the Labor Tribune. This show is brought to you by the very hardworking and dedicated employees, non-supervisory employees of the Estes County Division of Welfare. They are members of our union, CWA Local 1081. I'm David Weiner, president of the union and host of Labor's View. Tonight, we're very pleased and proud to have a young man with whom um, I've known for many years and with whom we've worked. He is the head of the People's Organization for Progress, known as POP, and they do some amazing things, as you will hear as this interview progresses. Larry, thank you very much David, for coming. David, good to be here. Uh, Give us a little background on your history. I know you're a Princetonian, so. <laughs> well, actually, uh, I'm a Newarker, or, or uh, born and raised uh, in this area. Um, a product of public schools, a graduate of Arts High School, and then, as you said, uh, a student at Princeton University. I got involved in the movement when I was 17 years old. I was the leader of a citywide student group, and. We had a sit-in down at the Gateway Hotel in 1971. That's like 45 years ago. It'll be 45 years. I think years. they just built it before that, right? Right, right. It's the same. It's Hilton Gateway now. It was just yeah. Gateway then. And as a result of that, um, I came into contact with the mayor of Newark. And as a result of that, I was appointed to the Newark Board of Education as a full voting member in 1971 at the age of 17, making me the youngest voting, full voting board member in the history of the country. The mayor being Ken Gibson. Ken Gibson, right. the first African-American mayor of Newark, right. New Jersey. And uh, so I did the three years on the board, then went back to Princeton, did four years uh, undergraduate work at Princeton University. While at Princeton, I was uh, one of the uh, key organizers of the anti-apartheid struggle on Princeton's campus, trying to get Princeton to divest its funds from company companies doing business with South Africa. And uh, we had a, a campus-wide student organization, and uh, we agitated, organized for uh, several years. And in my senior year, that was my second sit-in. We sat in, we took over Nassau Hall. 210 of us took over Nassau Hall in 1978. And the result was uh, Princeton divested from a couple of companies. Uh, How long was that demonstration? Um, the actual sit-in. Mm. The sit-in was two days. We took over the uh, Nassau Hall, which is the primary administration building, and a national monument. A lot of people don't know that was the headquarters for the Provisional Revolutionary Government of it's the United beautiful, States. Beautiful yes, campus, yes. Yeah. So we took that over, and um, and we got out of it with our skins. Nobody, it, we had such a unity on the campus, and they wouldn't dare have uh, retaliated right. against anyone. And, so uh, I did also did some graduate work at Princeton, but I returned to Newark in 1980. Uh, shortly thereafter, I organized a 400 family fuel, op fuel oil cooperative mm -hmm. called the People's Energy Cooperative, which organized families to buy their fuel oil in bulk. Mm -hmm. And I did that for a couple of years. As a matter of fact, you were showing me uh, the Rector Street uh, offices, and my office was literally two doors down um, in the Cathedral House. Ah, yes. it was Episcopalian. That's right, that's, that's right. right. I was in, we, they gave us a little office down there. And then shortly thereafter, um, I got back together with some friends who were in the high school student movement uh, uh, in, the, in the early 70s. We all were college graduates now. We all, most of us were married and had children or had children on the way, but we still wanted to be activists. And so we began a process that actually lasted more than a year. We started having these monthly meetings to discuss, you know, what, what our vision was. Because we had different visions. We didn't have the same vision. And it took us about a year. And at the end of that year, on the 28th of August, 1983, we formed the People's Organization for Progress which is a grassroots organization, works for racial, social, economic justice, and peace. And we formed POP because we wanted to have an organization that was more aggressive than the organizations we saw on the political horizon at that time. When I say organizations, I'm talking about particularly organizations in the black community, mm -hmm. more traditional organizations. We weren't opposed to them. We just felt we wanted to have something that was more proactive, 
that was action oriented and that was really street based. You know, um, m many people felt that after the 60s, the civil rights movement was taken. Now, I, I know this not to be really true, but it's a perception that mm -hmm. people had that the civil rights movement was taken out of the streets and into the suites. Right. And we wanted to bring it back into the streets. And so we formed POP 33 years ago. Mm -hmm. We've been in, in existence now. And um, uh, we're, we're, uh, we started out as a, a small collective in Newark. Now we're a regional wide organization. We have 11 branches in Jersey. We have a branch in New York City. We even have a branch in uh, North Carolina. Wow. But we, we want to have more brands. In fact, we get requests uh, to establish other branches, but we just organizationally are not, are not yet at a point uh, to do that, but we hope to be there uh, someday. And um, we probably, POP has been through several permutations, several phases, so to speak. And we're in a phase that really started in 1999 around the death of a young man named Earl Faison who was killed by the Orange Police. Uh, to make a long story short, the, his family contacted us and we began a campaign for justice for Earl Faison which lasted for three years. That was a female officer that shot him. What happened was there was a female officer, Joyce Cornegay, mm -hmm. who was shot by someone uh, on, two, uh, on a freeway drive right, right next, next to, to 280. 280 right. And unfortunately, what ensued thereafter was a kind of police wilding where they, even though they had a sketch of the person that uh, shot her and killed her, they began to stop any black person, any black man, you know, right. and uh, brutalize them. In fact, it's, it's so crazy that the then county prosecutor, Pat Hurt, had actually gone on television, I think twice, and announced that they had the killer of... Um, uh, Joyce Carnegie, and it wasn't the killer of Joyce Carnegie. And it was the fourth person that they actually arrested that they convicted for her death. And I, I say that in quotation marks because there's, there's always been a feeling that even that person may have not been the right person, but he's been serving a life sentence since um, around the year 2000 or so. But the Earl Faison case resulted in the conviction of five police officers it's the first time in the history, and probably the only time in the history of New Jersey, that five police officers were simultaneously convicted in connection with a police brutality case. Our reg regret is, is that uh, the state failed to even convene a grand jury. There were never any state charges for murder. The family and the community and the organizations, including POP, that supported them demanded federal intervention, de demanded that the Justice Department get involved, which they did. And a year later, uh, the U.S. Attorney at that time, this had to be like 2000, the summer of 2000, a year later the U.S. Attorney announced that according to the evidence they had that Earl Faison died in a stairwell of torture. Hmm. Not a stairwell of torture in Guatemala or the Congo or uh, Asia, Thailand, or somewhere. Where, where was it? Was it on Mechanic Street? It, it was, he died in the police headquarters oh. on Lincoln. Okay, I know. In I, Orange. I live right next to Right, on Lincoln, I know where it is. Lincoln Street in Orange. That's before Tremont. Right, in right. Orange, New Jersey. And so since that time, POP has really been kind of out there publicly as an organization working on not just police brutality. I mean, we're probably more known for that but we've, wor we've campaigned against hospital closings, we've campaigned against budget cuts and layoffs, we've campaigned against school closures, we've stood in the uh, doorways to prevent people from being evicted from their homes. I know you've picketed banks, I that was there in the freezing weather. Yes, yeah. yes. You seem to like cold weather. <laughs> well, we, we, the thing is we, we like are out there all year round, oh. so whether it's cold or whether it's hot, you know, uh, we're out there. So. That's really where we are. And, and the thing, I'd just like to finish this long sure. <laughs> statement yeah, sure. to say, good. Uh, the thing, the other thing that has characterized this phase of POP's development has been our close association with labor. Uh, and this goes back, this, this goes back to really the 
earlier years of P.O.P., before the organization was well known, when P.O.P. Act helped, actually helped form the New Jersey Rainbow Coalition, which uh, uh, of course supported the presidential campaigns of Jesse Jackson in 1984 and 88. Who runs the national That's right, that's yeah. right. And as a result of the work with the Rainbow Coalition, we came into contact with labor activists and began to develop early on a relationship with labor, particularly uh, in the early 80s, or the mid 80s, I should say, uh, labor helped to initiate a New Jersey, New Jersey anti-apartheid coalition that forced Governor Kane and the state to divest pension funds uh, from businesses doing business you know, with South Africa. We were part of that, and, and we began to develop these relationships with CWA and with AFSCME and other organizations with the auto workers, and we've continued that. And it's funny because those contacts and those relationships started as a matter of course. You know, you were there, we were there, so we worked together. But it's been since then over the years that I have learned, and even going back to my Princeton days, that I have learned the importance of the labor struggle in this country and uh, how labor and various unions had helped the civil rights movement and how uh, the benefits that labor has fought for has benefited African Americans. They were actually other organized minorities. the March on Washington in 63. That's right, that's right. And these were things I learned in way after high school because they don't teach labor no. history, unfortunately, in our schools. And I kind of le learned this at Princeton. Even when we were doing the anti apartheid struggle in Princeton, there was also a struggle around J.P. Stevens. I don't know mm -hmm. if you remember oh, yeah. that. The, 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 uh, the schmata the, in Yiddish, the, the, the right. clothing right, manufacturer right, down south. Right, and there was a nationwide campaign mm -hmm. to aid the J.P. Stevens workers. So the, the anti-apartheid folks and the J.P. Stevens folks, we worked together. But more so in recent years, I've, I've deepened my understanding and have come to appreciate uh, the role of labor. And I don't think the movement that we want to build to transform this country can be built without the participation of labor. It I is totally absolutely, agree. absolutely essential. Nor labor without organizations such as POP. Yes. It's, it's symbiotic. Let's move to the present. You have a big demonstration coming up on January 15th. Yes, yes. We had a press conference. You had a co press conference, which I was proud to take part in, which was, again, cold. <laughs> we stood there for an hour in front of the oh, Payne Monument at the Hall of Records. That was windy and right, cold. Right. But it was good. Right. It was good. And um, so tell us about January 15th, uh, Martin Luther King yes. celebration and what's going on. Yes. Because um, you want people to come. That's, that's right. That. January 15th is the real birthday of Martin Luther King. Uh, we celebrate the King holiday uh, as it was formulated by Congress on the third Monday in January. But the actual birth date of Dr. King is the 15th. Historically, almost from the beginning of the formation of the People's Organization for Progress, we celebrated the birthday of Martin Luther King. And, and that's something else maybe we could talk about when there's more time, you know. We'll do another show. Do another sure. show just on Dr. King. Uh, but historically, because of the role that Dr. King played in the civil rights movement, we've always uh, celebrated his birthday. And we've usually done it on the holiday. But conditions have become so um, difficult in the United States today uh, in the areas of civil rights, in the areas of labor and employment, housing, police brutality. That so where's the, where's the demonstration? Let's get that okay, in. Okay, okay. The demonstration is Friday. Right. January, January 15th. 15th. Right. Friday, January 15th, 12 noon. We're going to start at the Lincoln Monument. Which is in front of the courthouse, right, which, which is, is in, front in front of the Hall of Records. That's right. In it's, Newark. In, it's, it's in front of the Essex County Courthouse at the intersection of West Market Street and Springfield Avenue, right, right across the street from Essex County College. We're going to start there at 12 noon, and we're going to march to the federal building. And on back, Broad Street. That's right, on Broad Street and back. And then we're going into Essex County College, because we expect it's going to be cold. <sighs> we're not going to have a repeat of the press conference. I'm going to bundle up. We're going to take people into, uh, fortunately, the folks at Essex County are opening the building up for us um, so that we can 
go into one of the lecture halls and have speakers and everything there. But it's Friday, 12 noon, the Lincoln Monument, intersection of West Market Street and Springfield Avenue in Newark, New Jersey. We want everybody to be there, everybody to come and not just honor Dr. King, honor Dr. King and all the martyrs of the civil rights movement, both those who gave their lives and those who sacrificed in other ways, but also not just to honor what happened in the past, but to fight for the things that we need in the present. And Be the future. And the future, yes. yes. So uh, how much time we got, Jerry? Uh, at least uh, 11, 12 minutes. Good. Why don't you rattle off you don't have your little notepad with no. you, but, but I'm sure your, your memory, I don't know, mine's shot. Uh -huh. you? I'm a little older than you are. Uh, not much. Not much. Jerry's older than I am. But I'm you sure. wanted me to mention Jerry's my producer, by the okay. way. It's not some just guy hanging. <laughs> Jerry Schoenthal, excellent videographer. You call him up. Always on time. Always on. <laughs> Thanks, Jerry. He forgot he was supposed to be here today, but go ahead. Right. You want me to mention some of the demands? Please, yeah, okay. Sure. Uh, of course, the first demand would be to end police brutality. We demand justice for all victims of police brutality. There are four cases here in New Jersey that we're dealing with right at the moment. There are more than four, but there are four that we're dealing with. The Abdul Kamal case, he was unarmed when he was killed by Irvington police. Uh, Kashad Ashford case, he had no weapon in his hand when he was killed by the Lyndhurst police, Jerome Reed. He's on a dash cam video with his hands up, no weapons in his hand when he was killed by the Bridgeton police. And 14-year-old Radaz Hearns, who was shot in the back seven times by Trenton police, but he survived. And because he survived, they're charging him with crime hmm. instead of the people that shot an unarmed 14-year-old in the back. So we're calling on the U.S. attorney to investigate those cases because in all of those cases, grand juries came back with no indictment of the police officers. Which has been happening all across the country. All across the country. Right. So this is one of the reasons we're marching on the federal building, not just because it's the symbol of the federal government in Newark, but also because we want the U.S. Attorney, Paul Fishman, to launch official civil rights investigations into all those cases. Which ironically is named after Donald Payne. Oh, uh, Rodino. Rodino, I'm sorry, it's, Rodino. It's, it's a Rodino. It was my mother's building. congressman. I, I forgot. Right, right, right. No, D Donald used to have an office. Right yes, there. that's he, right. And, and now he's down the street. His son is His down son the street. His son is street, but the, the older right. one had an office there. And then, right, yeah. right. And so the other demands, we want an economic bill of rights, the right to a job at a living wage, affordable housing, free education for students, national health care. These, this was actually... Believe it or not, this actually predates Martin Luther King. It goes back to FDR, to Franklin Delano Roosevelt. In his last term, he was the only president to serve four terms, he began to talk about an economic bill of rights. Dr. King re-raised this issue uh, first uh, in his book, Why We Can't Wait. He called it a bill of rights for the socially disadvantaged, but then by 1968, by the year he was killed, he was simply calling it an economic bill of rights. We want a national jobs program. There are 23 million unemployed and underemployed in this country. We want action like FDR took where he created a national works program. I believe it was called the Works Progress Administration. At WPA, yes. Right, and, and it had many programs. He put 11 million people back They built to that work. little bridge that comes off of 1 and 9 in, over onto Broad Street. Not only, did he build, not only did the WPA build that bridge, the city subway, which runs today through Newark, I didn't know that one, is yeah. a WPA project. project. Hmm. It had been a canal, and they drained the canal. It put thousands of people back to work. They drained this canal. They laid the foundation. Laid. That subway has been running since 1938. I think they just recently replaced the cars. I think they had the old right. cars for right. They had the old cars for a long time. It's a short subway, but it's, it's very right. nice. It's very nice, yes. Yeah. So, we want an increase in the minimum wage to $15 per hour, and we want an increase in the wages of all working people. Uh, mo most folks haven't had a real increase in the last seven, eight years. I mean, if you were to factor in inflation, we're making less than our parents made, even though we're, our salaries say more dollars. Right. We can actually buy less than they did. So uh, we want an increase in wages. We want protection of workers' rights to unionize 
and collectively bargain, which is under attack all over the country, not just in these right-to-work states. It's under attack all over There's the nation. There's a Supreme Court, uh, Fletcher, right now. That's Supreme right. Court cases. I think they, they, they were supposed to rule on it on January 11th, I think, in a few days. But that's where they want to stop public employees from being able to charge non-members uh, a percentage of the dues. They want them to be able to just... That's the California case, right? Yeah. You're right. But it's now in front of SCOTUS. And uh, if that happens, because, you know, the public sector, that's the last vestige of the Republicans and conservatives to right. destroy labor is 35 percent organized across right. the country and if you kill the public sector you lose the kind of progressive that's right. works that you're and talking if, about if you kill the public sector and if you kill unions we're going to lose as we are we're losing the middle class that's right because unions help create the middle class in this country maybe we could even say the primary engine for the expansion of the middle class in the united states you know it's just a shame that our children don't learn labor history, real labor history. Now, when I was a student at South 17th Street School, I do remember we had social studies, and I do remember them saying something about Samuel Gumpers mm -hmm. and the Knights of Labor, but it stopped there. Right. It didn't tell you anything about the struggle for the eight-hour workday, Randolph. A. Philip Randolph, the CIO. We didn't learn about any of this stuff. So when we grow up as kids, we don't think unions are important. And so we don't join the union. We don't be active in the union. And we really need to do something I'll, to bring I'll labor history. I'll share this with you. When, back in the 80s, mm -hmm. I, I was so upset with that, that uh, the CWA at that time, there was no, it was slides. Mm -hmm. I got the slideshow, and you, there was one made for grammar school, one made for high school. And I went to a couple of the uh, Newark schools, particularly, I think it was, um, I forgot the word, it was at Lincoln? Mm -hmm. um, and did a uh, presentation to the kids right. about labor. Right. And I wish, I'm gonna see if we can try to replicate right. that again right. with modern technology. Right, because I didn't learn about A. Philip Randolph till I went to college. And I didn't learn about A. Philip Randolph in a college course. We used to have our own little study groups where we read what we wanted to read, and that's where I learned about A. Philip Randolph and the, what I would call really the alternative history of the Civil Rights Movement. You know, there's one history that's taught but then there's this other history that's not taught. And really, the part that's not taught is the most important part. People don't know, he, he started the union representing the railroad yes, porters. Yes, that's right. Um, uh, uh, the Pullman Car Pullman Porters. Car the porters. Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters right. was, st was started by A. Philip Randolph. But he called the first march on Washington. He called it in the 40s. And it's just the call so shook up people in power that uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt issued an executive order to, um, which would have enabled what we would then call Negroes to work in the uh, military right. uh, sector, um, military manufacturing, and so on and so forth. Which is how you had such a large That's population right. come up from the That's South. Right. That's right. That's right. And that, w and that was 43. Yes. That was 43. So he called the march off. And then they 20, begged them. I, I, they, right. I don't remember. I wasn't right, alive, but they but, begged. Jerry right, was alive. But right, was alive. right. But 20 years later, he calls the Great March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. And see, this is something that people need to remember. The March on Washington wasn't just about civil rights. It was about civil rights. Right. That certainly was a cornerstone. But even the title was the Great March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. And if you just go and look at any, like, black studies history book and just look at the pictures, you can see that people were carrying all kinds of signs. Yes, they were carrying civil rights signs, but they were carrying signs for full employment. They were carrying signs for affordable housing. They were carrying signs for quality education and integration of schools. Kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? It, it sounds like the agenda that we've been working on for the last half century. And um, so this is, it's important to understand that history. And, and it, once you understand history, it helps you to understand where you are now. And where we are now is that there are reactionary forces, anti-labor, anti-black, anti-minorities, anti-women. Kind of like Trump. Right. <laughs> that want to reverse not 75 years, literally, they want to reverse 100 years of social progress in this country. They're trying to bring us, literally bring us back 
if not to the days of slavery. They're trying to bring us back to the days of the robber barons when there were no unions, when people had no rights to protect them. You know, a lot of people don't even know that women didn't even get the right to vote until the 20, 20th century. Suffrage, yeah. Right. And they had to fight for that. They're against women's reproductive rights. They're against women's rights. They're against civil rights. They're against workers' rights. So we need to build a countervailing movement to check them, and not only check them, but to push them out of the way so that we can continue the social progress that we've been making in this country since the 60s. I mean, there's literally, literally, it, it even precedes Dr. King's death. If, if you read some of Dr. King's books, you read next, the next to last book, which is Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community? Dr. King was already lamenting the fact that the country had turned its back on the war on poverty had turned its back on the struggle for well, desegregation. turned its back on him because of his position right, on, on the Vietnam on, War. On the Vietnam War. So we have to, we, we've really been almost like a helicopter, like hovering in place for the last uh, 40 years. You know, the wind is blowing us around, but we have to get our, our, ourselves together, get our movement back together, and we have to push back because if we don't push back, this country will look, like a third world republic because that's where that's the direction we're going in now well speaking of pushing back we're coming to the end so <laughs> okay. why don't you give one more pitch for the for the demonstration yes please everyone come out to the uh dr martin luther king march for racial equality economic justice and peace on friday january 15th 12 o'clock noon at the lincoln monument at the intersection of west market street and Springfield Avenue in Newark, New Jersey. Be there, dress warmly, oh. and let's get ready to march for justice. You got it. Larry Ham, thank you very David, much for coming on the you, show. Man. We'll do it again, All right. especially on Dr. King. All right. And on behalf of the members of Local 1081 of the Communications Workers of America, I thank you for watching Labor's View. I'm David Weiner, and we hope to see you on future shows. Thank you.